Okay, good afternoon everyone. Please open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. We're in Isaiah chapter 40. This is Isaiah's Gospel. Part I want to jump right into it while you're turning there. Uh, I want you to uh, imagine, if you will, uh, a, a man with a granddaughter, uh, maybe someone like Roy who has like 57 granddaughters, I think, out there. Had 17, I think, uh, a few weeks ago. But uh, he has a very special relationship with with, his, with, a, with one of his granddaughters, and she he loves her a lot, and he's seeing her grow up, and uh, he realizes he doesn't have much time with her, so what he's going to do is he's going to write her a letter, and he's going to seal it in an envelope, and the envelope he's going to write, to be opened on your wedding day. So that uh, when that special day comes and it's a wonderful celebration, she takes the envelope and she opens it up, she takes the letter out and she reads uh, just words of wisdom about, uh, you know, life as a wife and as a mother and just uh, being married and, and just all this wisdom that this loving grandfather has accumulated over the years and just had the foreknowledge and forethought to put it all down on paper for her just in case he wouldn't have that chance to experience it with her uh, in the future. Well, that is the picture that we have in Isaiah chapter 40. And that is <coughs> Isaiah, uh, all throughout his, his book, from chapter 1 to chapter 39, he's, he's writing in the time of about King Hezekiah and he's giving warning after warning after warning saying turn it around uh, stop living for yourself look to God repent uh, he's waiting for you just to, to, to give it to him and, and bless you and, and renew you and in chapter 39 he realizes it's just not going to happen Israel Judah has gone off the edge of the cliff Assyria is going to come down as a punishment from God they're going to be defeated and destroy. Jerusalem is going to be uh, broken down. The temple is going to be burned down. All the inhabitants are going to be deported off to a city called Babylon. And it's going to be a hard time for the people of uh, Israel. And then <clears throat> Isaiah says, okay, that's going to happen. And I'm not going to be here to experience it with you, but there's going to be a day when God is going to bring you back whole and there's good news for you. From 1 to 39, chapters 1 to 39, it's been bad news, but from chapter 40 all the way to the end of Isaiah, he's going to turn the corner and it's going to be the gospel of the good news of grace of God's salvation and deliverance for the people of Israel returning back from Babylon. And this chapter that uh, we're going to open today, we're actually going to, we're going to go all the way through it. I, start, I preached about three verses out of it last week, and I realized this is such an important chapter in the book of the Bible that I need to go through all of it, because it is just a great gospel message in that chapter right there. And uh, in, this, in this chapter, uh, it's so pivotal that uh, so many of the writers of the New Testament and people of the New Testament have quoted it again and again. I said that we're going through the Gospel of Isaiah, meaning that all of the passages that are quoted out of Isaiah in the New Testament is what I'm going to be covering this uh, half year all the way through Easter. And chapter 40 is so packed that six authors are quoting directly out of this one chapter. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospel writers, quoting what I um, what we covered last week. We've got John the Baptist who quoted it himself. We've got Jesus who quotes out of this uh, uh, chapter. Uh, we've got Peter the Apostle who quoted out of this. We'll see that in a minute. And also Paul who wrote a lot of it. You can go from the beginning all the way to the end to Revelation and you can find things out of this, this chapter. It's just so amazing and so good that it needs to be preached. So that's what we're going to cover today, and uh, it's not, uh, I usually have 
I'll usually cover about ten verses when I when I preach. We're going to go all through, and uh, it's so good. It's it's just it preaches itself so that uh, basically a lot of the time I'm just going to read. <laughs> We're going to read the the scripture itself and just let it impact you because it's that good. <laughs> okay. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it to you. And uh, I'm going to ask you to pick up with me, and we'll read it together in the middle section, maybe somewhere between verses 6 uh, through 11. And then uh, I'll read again through the middle part, and then uh, at the end, uh, verses 27 or 28 all the way to 31, uh, we'll pick it up together and we'll close it together. It's that good. And it's going to take us a few minutes to read it together, but hey, it's the Word of God, so it's worth reading. Uh, but let me begin, and then I'll, I'll let you know when to come in. Again, uh, Isaiah is now turning the corner in his gospel, and he is saying, okay, you're in Babylon, it's been terrible, it's time for a new message. And here's the message. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's read together uh, verse 6 through 11. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fail, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, Go up on a Mount Hanantin, you who bring good tidings to Jerusalem. Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Let me pick it up here, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in the basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in the balance? Who has understood the mind of our Lord? or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scale. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor is animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man who pours a bit such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. The whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare him? 
Who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Let's pick it up together, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The very words of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a good amount of time just to read a whole chapter out loud. I, I love that. I love it. Uh, what is Isaiah doing in this chapter? He, uh, I think, is basically sitting out to his hearers. This is a, basically a sermon that uh, Isaiah himself preached. And basically he's uh, telling the people, uh, uh, lays it out for them in verse 6. There it is, in verse 9, verse 9, excuse me, saying, look, you're in trouble, you're in a land of desolation, God is going to come, and I want you to get ready for it. I've got words of comfort for you, and there's two things I want you to know. Here is your God. Take a good look at who your God is. In verse 9, it says, here is your God. Point number one. Point number one, verse 10. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He's coming, and he is the king, he is the ruler, he is transcendent. He is the transcendent God. And uh, from verse 12 all the way to verses 26, you'll see him break down the meaning of that transcendence of God. And I'll break that down just a little bit in the time that I have. But point number two he gives to us in verse 11. He's transcendent, verse 10, and verse 11, he's tender. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. God is both transcendent, almighty, creator, sovereign God. And he's also tender, meek, loving, gentle, kind shepherd. That's what he's talking about. Last week, uh, we looked at verses 3 through 6, and uh, Isaiah uh, talks about the valleys being raised up, and that's talking about those of us who are humbled and broken and heartbroken. He's going to raise the humble. He's going to raise the valleys. But he's tender. He's merciful right now. But not only does he raise the valleys, he brings down the mountaintops. He, he levels the hills. And uh, that means he, 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 all the proud in heart, all those who think they're important in their own eyes, he brings them low. Uh, I want to just stop right there for a minute, and I want you to consider what that means for the church. I want you to, to realize that you who have money, you who have resources, you who come from a wealthy background, you who are secure in finances and position and power, you are of a low position in this church. James says that very clearly. He says, those of you who are rich and wealthy, take pride in your low position. You're here to serve those who have a higher position, and that is those of us who are least in the kingdom of God, those who have no representation in government, those who are aliens in this land, those of us who uh, have fewer resources and fewer finances, those of us who are struggling just to make it every month, week by week, paycheck to paycheck. 
those are the ones who are first in the kingdom of God. Because God lifts up the valleys and he brings down the hills. And so that's the picture that Isaiah is showing. Here is your God. He's transcendent. And basically all that talk in verses 12 all the way to 26 of God being this almighty, magnificent God. He's talking about the waters of how God measures all the waters in his hand, not just the waters, but the heavens. And he just measures those between his thumb and his, his middle index. And that's how big God is over creation. And he's so big that he is, he's more than all the nations put together. What's the, what's the expression there that he says? Uh, uh, surely the nations are like a drop from the bus. He's that big. Okay, Lebanon is not sufficient. He's more than just religion. He's more than all of our worship. If you put together all the worship services, all the choirs, all the, all the noise that uh, everybody wants to make, all the offerings, all the cathedrals, all the buildings, it's still not enough to even be worthy to lift up to God. He's that big. And if you look at all the powers, all, all the all the big important people. Last week, uh, who was it? Obama and who? The, maybe the two arguably the most powerful people in the world. They met together over in Washington. To God, they're like grasshoppers. They're just these little bugs that hop around from leaf to leaf on the land. And all their big talk of change and power and government and economy, it's just chirping to God. Tweet, tweet. And they have these big important dinners and they meet and they have all this pomp and circumstances and honor. It's like them just staying in, you know, like these grasshoppers who, who go from blade of grass to blade of grass. That's how it is to God. He's that big. He's that large. Uh, when he looks down at the earth, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. To God, the earth itself, when we look at the, at the, at the globe, uh, this week there was a celebrity, a Japanese man, I, think, I don't know if he was in his 40s, 50s, and he just returned from running around the world, literally. It took him 755 days, I think. Uh, 62, 762 days, and I think the program was... Oh, he's 62, thanks, excuse me. And he, he's just been running for the past three, four years around the world. It took him that long. And I had much respect. I, I can't run around the block in 62 days. You know, it's that, it's that hard for me. But he did it. Praise God. Hey, good for you. Good on you. Uh, but to God, you know, he made the world. To God, the globe is just a little, you know, beach ball. He looks, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And you look at the heavens and all the glory. I know you can't see them here in Hiroshima. There's too many lights. And, you know, when, when Kyohei holds my hand, he looks up. Oh, there's the moon, Daddy. Yeah. Oh, look, the star, Daddy. There's one star in the sky. Uh, but uh, if, you go, if you go behind Miyajima, on the other side, uh, away from the city, there's a little beach you can go to. You look up at the sky. It's, it's grand. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. There's just stars everywhere. Uh, I once spent uh, a weekend with my grandmother in the Philippines, 2000, and it was the beach. We have a beachfront lot property, and she says, "Go out. The stars are low." She says. So I go outside, and it's just a beautiful night, a clear evening, nice breeze, no mosquitoes, and I look out, and she was so right. I mean. What she meant by the stars are low is that you can see the heavens all the way down to the horizon. You know, normally you have to look up to see the stars. But there on the beach in the Philippines, I just look forward and there are the heavens laid out before me. It's that beautiful. And you just awe and wonder at it. And God says, to me, that's just like a little camping tent. He spreads it out like a tent, a canopy to live in. God is is that large, that big. And some of you need to know this. 
here is your God. Some of you need to realize this and internalize it. Why? Because your worship is too small. Maybe you might come to church and, wow, we've got to sing another song? We've just sang four, we've got to sing another one? You know, it's two o'clock, we, yeah, we need time for ten. We need what, drums? There's ten people in here, what do we need drums for? Because God is that big. And it could be ten, it could be five, it could just be me in this audience. But the audience is not me, the audience is God when we worship. And it's not that we're playing music and we're singing these songs for those of us here sitting in the... We're joining the heavens. We're joining the angels who surround the throne continually. And they don't just say, holy, holy, holy. The Hebrew is saying, they shout, holy. And the next guy says, holy. And the guy on top of that says, holy. That's how big God is. He is worth shouting, pounding, singing. And some of us were just... Oh, 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 you know, you need to worship a big God. Amen. You need to realize that God sits enthroned above the heavens and is worthy of just sing it out, shout it out. I was sitting in my car, I was in the car this week. Uh, and I'm going to work, I'm stuck at a traffic light, and I'm, I got my, my worship CD on. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting geared up for work. You know, I got students with attitudes. I got, you know, co-workers who, who can't, I can't relate to, and I, I need to praise God. I got to get ready for work, you know. And I'm sitting there, I don't know what song I was singing. I don't know, God will make the way. And I'm, I'm going all out. I'm stuck at this light. And I'm, I'm, it's like 7.30 in the morning. I'm blasting it out, just worshiping God, right? And I just, I just look at the rear view mirror of the car in front of me. I just happen to glance there, and the woman in front of me, in the car in front of me, is just looking at me through a rear view mirror like, who is this guy behind me? You know, just, who, he's lost his mind. What is he shouting at? What is he doing? Man, I need to praise my God. I need to, do, I need to sing out loud. And that's what you need to do you need to worship God. You need to sing six, seven, eight songs of praise. He's that big. He's that big. We think our problems, we think the world, we think our circumstances, are, it's just too much it's bearing down. It's, I can't handle it. I, I'm, I'm getting crushed. No, your God is bigger than that. So worship Him. And the great thing is, is when you worship instead of worry, it changes you. It gives you the strength. You know, I'll get into that in a minute. But man, I need that in the morning just to get to work. I need that, that power surge, that lift, that caffeine of worship. And I want you to do that. You need to know, here is your God. He is transcendent. He is almighty. I got one more point, and then we're going on. I get a second point is in uh, verse 12. Excuse me, verse 11. Tends his flock like a shepherd, he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He generally leads those who had, oh man, what a picture of God. What a picture, oh, just sits and thrown above the earth. Look, he's right there with us, walking, not with the strong, not with the rich, not with the pop, but with us. The weak, the weary, the tired, the, the, the sleep deprived, the disrespected, the unrepresented. The, the ill-equipped, in a, every, oh, that's just our God. I, I'm losing myself here. But uh, I want you to just consider with me real quick. I, I threw up here Psalm, verse eight, Psalm 8. If you want to have, have the equivalent of Isaiah 40 in the Psalms, Psalms is actually the most quoted book in the New Testament. Second is Isaiah. But uh, Psalm 40 is, is just a parallel to Psalm, excuse me, Isaiah 40 is a parallel to Psalm 8. And uh, it starts off, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set the glory on that. It's just, wow, God, you're glorious. How is God glorious? How is he, mar how is he wonderful? He is wonderful not in that he's so big and powerful and mighty. Not in that at all. He is amazing. 
His glory, His majesty is in this one thing. He's able to make the small great. That's what makes God so awesome. He makes the unworthy worthy. He makes the baby sing out praises. He makes man lower than the angels. Just this thing made of dirt. And he's able to lift him up and say, you have dominion over all of this. That's what makes God so great. That's his grace. That's his magnificence. That's his majesty. It's not how big he is, but how small he can get. That's what makes Jesus so wonderful. That he considered equality with God not something to be checked and hold on to, but he took it off and he became a man. Not just a man, but a servant. He took off his clothes and he washed the feet of his disciples. He fed them. He is that tender, that small, for our sake. Because we couldn't do it. We couldn't go to God on our own. We couldn't find God because we're so blind, we're so lost. And we had no way of doing it. We are we're the, the, the ram who's trapped in the thicket by our own horns. And we can't pull ourselves out. And God just takes us. And he doesn't just put us on his shoulders. He doesn't do that. I, he did what I did. God doesn't put you on his shoulders. That's for work. That's for, for strength. He puts you in his, he carries you close to his heart. That's what God has. If you are here and you're humble, you, you've been broken, you've walked a hard road, and you're tired, oh, God is here for you. He's here to pick you up, not just grab you, but to pick you up, to cut you and, and hold you close to this. That's a place of safety, warmth, and security that no nothing can give us. No, no blanket, no house, no, no nothing. Only the arms of, of God. And how does uh, Isaiah break that down for us? Well, uh, Israel was known to complain and to grumble. We're in Babylon. Why has God forsaken us? Why has He forgotten us? Why does He not care? And Isaiah is going, don't, don't you even know? Haven't you, haven't you been taught since you were a little boy reading the Bible? Don't you know God is the everlasting God? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is Yahweh, the God of the covenant. He doesn't forget the love that He has for people. That's Yahweh. He's not one who, who gets tired and weary. No, 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 no. He's got strength to spare, and he's got power to share. That's how great God is. We think, okay, God is so great. God is so big. God is so mighty. How could he care for someone like me? Uh, this is something I came across the other day. God is not too great to care he is not too great to care. He is too great not to care. Not too great to care. He is too great not to care. That's what makes God so wonderful, is that he would care for us. That's what makes us a, 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 a father so good. Not that he can provide all that he, he, he can for his children, but that he can give his children all the care that they need. That's what makes a husband so good. It's not that he's able to be a man for his wife, but he can be a gentleman for his woman. That's what makes a man a man. That's what makes God so good, is that he can be so tender and so kind to us. He does care. That's why you can cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. That's why I can boast in my weakness. For God's power is made perfect in my weakness. And when I am weak, that's when I am strong. It's because God cares. And so, Mitaki, I just want to say, here is your God. That's it. Here is your God. He's transcendent. He's almighty. You need to worship him as that God. But at the same time, he's 
tender, he's kind, he's gentle. And he invites you. If, you. if you've sinned and you feel, God, I know I messed up, he doesn't say, that's it, we're done. He says, no, 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 come, come. Let me heal you, let me wash you, let me cleanse you, let me take care of you. If you're hungry and you feel like, I don't know, I, I'm just searching God, I need something to sustain me, he's saying, yes, come to me, I will give you rest. I've got food for you that will sustain you this whole weekend. If you're tired, if, if you're lonely, if you're alone, you say, look, I'm, I've got my Holy Spirit to walk with you every day. Come to me. Come to me. I'm going to care with you. I'm worried. I'm going to travel. I'm going to get on this plane this week. Uh, you know you know how I am with rough and turbulence. I got, the, I got the whole world in the palm of my hand. Come to me. Come to me. So let's take a moment uh, to bow our head, to close our eyes, to reflect on our God for just a moment. And while we do that, I'm going to ask uh, check your stand. I go to come on up and get us ready. Would you reflect on your God? Would you reflect on who He is? Do you need to worship Him more? Do you need to worship Him better? Would you reflect on your shepherd? Do you need to come to Him again in brokenness and humility? What is it? And so, Lord, we, we come to You and we bow our heads, we, we are humbled, and Father, we worship you first as God and King and Ruler. And Lord, we embrace you like so many of those who embraced you while you were here. We reach out to touch the cloak of your garment, just as so many try to do, to receive our healing, to be made well. Lord, we believe that you touch us, you reach out to us, that you need us where we are. We thank you for being a God that does that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you all to rise. Let's spend a minute in worship together as we close our time.